Well, you're listening to Money Talks. My name is Michael Campbell. Money Talks is brought to you by Solera Club. Solera Club is a royalty-based investment in the tech sector. Royalty means that you're first in line. There are no fees attached with it. And for more information, go to soleraclub.com. A moment first off about the federal budget. Well, first off, there's no chance that any federal budget, probably any federal government, is going to be able to satisfy a majority of the people because it's based on a massive fallacy perpetrated by politicians that governments can do just about anything. Unfortunately, financial reality is the bucket of cold water that reminds us that it can't. It's interesting to see all the complaints about the federal budget, any federal budget, though. Uh, you know, there's no way it could satisfy the incredible number of groups who want government to take more of someone else's money and put it toward their pet projects, whether it's something like subsidized daycare or free university tuition. The demands made all the more difficult to meet by the fact that all three levels of government combined already take about half the income of a huge chunk of Canadians, and the deficit is already about two and a half times higher than originally promised. The straightforward reality is that governments can't do everything. And nowhere is that more evident when it comes to promises about the economy. I mean, the majority of Canadians and media bought into what I would argue is the biggest fiction about government peddle today, and that is governments can manage or control the economy. Maybe it makes us feel better to think they could. I mean, you don't have to look any further than the last federal election to see how often that line was offered up and repeated. You had questions like, which leader is the best choice to manage the economy? Gosh, that's nonsense. And it can be exposed with even a moment of thought. I mean, our government did not control any of the major factors that have had the biggest impact on our economy and chances on you over the past several years. They had nothing to do with the oil price decline or the fall in commodity prices in general or the fallout from the subprime mortgage crisis. They don't control the currency. They're not even the biggest driver of interest rates. But despite these obvious facts, the common political narrative suggests that with the right policies, the right prime minister, the right party in power, governments can manage or control the economy. Well, that's simply not true. And there's tons of evidence to suggest it's not true. I mean, actually, it's more dangerous than that, given that the evidence is clear that the more government intervenes, the worse the results. I don't have to go with examples like the Soviet Union or the former Soviet Union, Venezuela or Cuba. All you have to do is look at the European Union with its massive bureaucracy administering a, regular deter a regulatory burden that has killed entrepreneurialism, has produced double-digit unemployment, significant sovereign debt problems, an unstable banking system, and flatlining economic growth. Those are the results of governments that think they can control the economy or manage the economy. More to the point, what's incredible and dangerous is when the policies in place don't produce the jobs or the economic growth, and that's the constant uh, narrative, the rationale is that governments actually didn't do enough. They haven't spent enough money. So what do they do? They increase borrowing and they raise taxes. The government's answer to our economic problems is always the same. Hey, let's do more government in the form of higher taxes and more regulation, often more borrowing, more spending. That's the opposite of what needs to be done. Government does have a role to play. We've got to create a tax and regulatory environment that attracts capital investment. They know, which is, they know that already, which is why they're so worried about the tax changes that the Trump administration is talking about. We had it good under President Obama, whose constant push for higher taxes and business and upper income individuals made it better to be in Canada. They had more government regulation, too. Canada was an attractive destination for capital investment. That's why, if you remember, Burger King moved their head office to Canada when they bought Tim Hortons. But Donald Trump is talking about changing that very dramatically. The challenge is made all the more difficult in Canada because we got the two other levels of government to take into account. We always talk about the feds, but that's not the story. You've got to look at the anti-growth policies that are enacted at both the municipal and the provincial level. All you're asking is, is this a disincentive for people to invest their capital? That's the key to economic growth. I don't even have to go any further than Ontario and Alberta. In evaluating government policies in the economy, I think it's very straightforward. 
You just simply have to ask, does the policy make it more attractive or less attractive to invest in the city, the province, or the country? So if you're assessing the federal budget in terms of does it make it more or less attractive for capital investment, unfortunately it's a, a big yawn. The good news, by the way, and I was relieved when I saw the federal budget, that it was not the tax and grab budget. That was all the talk in the lead up. I was relieved they didn't change capital gains taxes. That would have been a disaster. So I'll pat Finance Minister Morneau on the back for that. But the bad news is it also did nothing concrete to encourage capital investment. It was not an aggressive document. Lots of talk. But the symbolism and talk doesn't get it done in the economic realm. I think what? Innovation was mentioned 261 times. I mean, there was a huge list. But the economy responds to concrete examples. In the same way that you make investments, people and businesses make their capital investments. So, as I say, good news, it didn't make it worse. Bad news, it didn't make it better. Money Talks is brought to you by Solera Club. Solera Club is to be found. All information at soleraclub.com. I'll take a break. A couple of big stories with Mike Levy coming your way. Hey, we're going to be talking with Aaron Dunn coming up after the top of the hour. We're about 20 minutes away from Aaron Dunn showing us, hey, a couple of great ideas for investing for a yield. i uh, got a big fat idea. You know, with the record low mortgage rates that we've been having, but we've seen this budge and this edge up in interest rates in general, obviously the leader being in the States. Well, what about that? Should you change from your variable rate mortgage, which you've enjoyed? When do you change into sort of a fixed rate mortgage, maybe a five-year mortgage? I'll talk about that coming up very shortly. Plus, I've got a great goofy award. So much coming your way. Stay with us right here on the Money Talks Network. You're just over 40 minutes away from a shocking stat that every Canadian should know about. But right now, let me bring in Michael Levy. Mike, i got a couple things to ask you about here today. Uh, one is sort of a good news. The other is bad news. I'll start with the easier one. We've been talking a ton about ch uh, tech and the way it's changing how we do things, and including the employment, but society, convenience, that kind of stuff. And I wanted to ask you about Starbucks here. You know, I remember when, uh, well, who is it? Howard Schultz is their CEO, I guess. And he was saying that Starbucks is, you know, more of a technology company. And, uh, you know, and had a lot of people shaking their head, to be honest. Well, Mike, and they have because we all know Starbucks is a coffee company. And there's no doubt that they really still are. But his vision is Starbucks is, Starbucks is a technology company. And, uh, you know, that started, Mike, when you could order uh, on their mobile app. You could order either from home or on your smartphone by just uh, going to your mobile app and typing in what you wanted and then going to the store and picking it up. And well, how last, successful uh, was that, Mike? <laughs> Sorry, Mike. Sorry? Me, uh, how successful was that? You know, I mean, uh, yeah, they did it, but, I mean, did it work? Well, it does, Mike. Seven million people a month Woo. ordered through their mobile app last year. And um, uh, Howard Schultz says that uh, within a few years, uh, it's going to be 50% of its ordering will come from smartphones. Wow. No, I mean, that's astounding. Well, I'm astounded at the number, 7 million per month. For, let's, just, let's just think about that for a second. Coming just through the mobile app, that's a heck of a lot of coffee and specialty drinks. Well, it is, Mike, but now they're rolling out a new uh, um, app, and this is voice uh, the voice ordering. You're going to yeah. be able to order. You just tell your order, and this also is going to be through your uh, smartphone, and it's currently in trial to 100,000 Starbucks customers, and by year end it will be available nationwide in the U.S. and then being rolled out to Canada. And, Mike, uh, it, it, it is just so simple but it is absolutely the cutting edge of what's coming when you want to do things online, want to do things digitally. But basically, what you're going to do is you're going to voice your order, give your order exactly the way you want it. It doesn't matter how complicated it is. You'll do it on your handheld device, your smartphone, and it will immediately send you back a text and confirm immediately of what you have ordered. And then... When you confirm that, it will come back to you and say when your order will be ready and what Starbucks to pick it up at. And when I say when, your order uh, is going to be able to be picked up at 3rd and Cherry in Seattle, and it will be ready between 10 and 16 minutes from right now. Done. Yeah. Uh, what's that, what do you think that will do for employment? Just a quick, I don't want to go off topic, but what do you think it will do for employment? 
Well, Mike, it really isn't off topic because we've been talking about it. Because the, the the minute they go to this kind of an app, this kind of a way of ordering, it's going to reduce the people, the people working in Starbucks who take your orders. Now, it's not going to reduce the baristas who make it. There's also going to be people there uh, that for for walk-ins. But you're going to have paid through your Starbucks card or some other smart card that you have in your system. So there'll be no money changing hands. There'll be no order given when you get to the store you'll just come simply whip through and pick it up my goodness gracious you know what but you know what i like about his attitude uh you know mr schultz's attitude is he says it's a technology company i think that would be a good starting point for every company you know we know that uh, so many canadian companies are ill prepared for the technological change that's coming they're not seeing it you know, and there's, uh, let alone our governments, let alone employment uh, aspects of it. But, yeah, I think that's what it is. Everybody becomes a tech company, but that's a fascinating one. But sort of speaking of that, I said there's a bad news side. I know that you followed the layoffs that have taken place uh, consistently in the, in the sort of mainstream media, but specifically we had Post Media laying off people this week. Well, we did, Mike, and, you know, there was two stories this week, and we've decided to key in on Post Media, but uh, Sears also, bricks and mortar department stores, but it's going into the modern age, and whether you're talking about Post Media or the problem Sears is having, let's take a look at Post Media, and once again, it's physical newspapers. It's the mm-hmm. fact that people are going digital, they're getting their news online, and not necessarily from conventional sources, and Post Media laid off more than 50 employees, actually 54 for employees at the Vancouver Sun and Province on Friday. And just shake your head, a 29 from the newsroom, and you've got to wonder who's left, and they're just gutting uh, the traditional newsrooms that they have, and what are they going to then supply to their readers that has some sort of local flavor that gives people news, whether online or whether you actually hold a physical newspaper. And Mike, just, I, I just reminded me to go back in my career in retail, and when we first started with Woodward's in the late 60s, and George Dennison Glanville, he was the first non-Woodward family president of the famous department store in B.C. and Alberta, told me when we were talking about how you do business, he says, you can't cut your way to prosperity. Eventually you have to increase sales in order to go forward and survive. And boy, does that ever apply to the likes of Post Media and other who are trying to cut expenses to make themselves profitable, but not able to increase sales in order to get to the bottom line. Well, as you said, though, Mike, it's because the, the, the variety of advertising outlets has exploded thanks to the Internet, you know, and the, and the opportunities there. And, and you look at all the numbers, and it tells you that Internet advertising continues to grow. So it is a challenging, you know, environment. But, I mean, there are some, I think, of the Orange County Register down, uh, down in uh, Southern California. It's done well. There's, not, there's other publications that sort of have met this challenge, it looks like. Well, the Washington Post is the poster boy poster person for being able to turn around a actual newspaper that was Jeff Bezos everybody uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon everybody shook their head and sc- scratched their head and said what is he doing buying an actual paper newspaper but in fact in subscriptions and online they are making money actually they made about 34 million dollars in the last quarter and they didn't gut their newsroom they didn't uh, got the employees. I mean, there were, were those that were in the making of physical newspapers. They changed their plant, and they did lay off a lot of people there. But what they did is looked how to increase sales, how to bring readers to the actual newspaper. And uh, this is what I think the uh, Post Media, National Post, Sun Province, Calgary Herald, Edmonton Journal, the Sun Newspaper Group in Canada – are not doing, and Mike, indicative of what they're trying to do, they had to pay $2.3 million in retention bonuses to their executives to keep them aboard this floating, Mm -hmm. barely floating ship. And even after paying the the likes of Paul Godfrey, the publisher, the chief executive, 900,000 and hundreds of thousands to other executives to keep them on board, Two of them, since they paid that, are now gone because they just don't want to be aboard this ship. Well, as you say, massive changes. I mean, this is the thing that we can't ignore. My, my certainly, uh, my 
sentiments go out to the people who've lost their jobs, uh, you know, oh. that way. I mean, it's just it's the most horrible thing, I think, is when you lose your job through no fault of your own uh, at any rate. But, uh, Mike, thanks very much for taking the time. Uh, lots to think about there. Okay, Mike. Have a good weekend. Take a break. Come back. Hey, if you've been on a variable rate mortgage, is there some sort of timing you should be aware of to switch to a fixed rate? That's one of the big questions being asked today in light of the U.S. raising their rates. Kyle Green's going to be with me. We'll talk about that in just a moment on The Big Fat Idea. You're only about 12 minutes away from Aaron Dunn joining me. He's got a couple of great ideas for you if you're looking for uh, investment income, looking for uh, growth with investment income. I'll chat with him coming up. Also got a quote of the week, but right now it's time for the big fat idea. Maybe this week I should have called it the big fat question. Kyle Green joins me, mortgage specialist with the Green Mortgage Team. Kyle, I, you know, it's very straightforward. I've been looking at this rise in interest rates. Really, you could peg it from July on, uh, you know, in the States. You know, and, and a lot of talk now is that, you know, that that record low interest rate environment's coming to an end. It will start seeing a bump up. And I wanted to ask you about people who have been on variable rate mortgages. And we've been telling them, don't worry till 2018. But what's your take on that? I mean, at some point, shouldn't someone uh, look at, look to lock in? Yeah, so the, the question is, you have to be watching both variable rates and fixed rates. So the prime rate is unlikely to increase for the next year or two. At least that's what most economists are predicting. Um, the problem, though, is that when you go to lock in a variable rate into a fixed rate mortgage, you actually need to be watching bond yields. That's how fixed rate mortgages are calculated. And bond yields are, are likely to rise if the U.S. Fed continues to increase rates down south. So it, a lot of the time, people make the mistake of looking at locking in their variable rate when the prime rate has gone up. And they say, oh, maybe I should go to lock in my fixed rate now. And, and unfortunately, it's likely that if the prime rate doesn't move for the next couple of years, it's much more likely that bond rates would have moved up over the next few years and you're actually looking at locking into a rate that's much higher in one or two years than what's currently available on the uh, on the marketplace. So so quickly, it, I mean, obviously it depends on people's individual circumstances, but are you starting to see more people come in? Are you starting to recommend that? Like, what, what give me, uh, so answer that and then give me what the best five-year rate is right now. Yeah, and, and you know what, it, it, as it's, as you said, it does come down to people's circumstances. Um, I'm still recommending variable for a lot of our investors. Uh, mm -hmm. The big challenge is from a mortgage perspective, your penalty to break a mortgage, if it's a variable rate, is just three months interest. A uh, penalty to break a fixed rate mortgage is either three months interest or this interest rate differential penalty, which can be, in many cases, two to five times greater than the three month penalty. Sure. And so okay. it goes further than what happens with interest rates is also a, a potential penalty uh, calculation that you need to consider. Um, so it really depends on the circumstances, but five-year fixed rate right now, there's actually a really wide gap. If you're a first-time home buyer putting less than 20% down, which is where the best pricing is, you're around 2.59. If you're putting okay. um, around 20% down, then the pricing is more like 2.79, 2.84 with most banks. Okay, well, Kyle Green is a mortgage specialist, but go to greenmortgageteam.ca, www.greenmortgageteam.ca. Uh, get more information from Kyle. Thanks for the time. I'll come back. I've got a quote of the week and Aaron Dunn.